Hi folks, and welcome to this session on Advanced IAM, where we'll be covering tips and tricks around IAM policy management. I'm Blake, a product manager here at Google, where I primarily focus on the cloud identity and access management product, which serves as a central point for access policy management and authorization enforcement across the Google Cloud platform. We're here today to dive a bit deeper than usual into how you manage your access policies, particularly through the API, as well as best practices in this area. We're going to be taking a look at the policies themselves, where they can be configured across your cloud infrastructure, how, based on your policies, Google determines when to grant access to a user, different versions of the policy schema that are available, and finally, how you can manage your policies more safely by following some simple best practices. Let's look at how IAM policies appear themselves when you're managing them through the G Cloud command line or directly through the API. Among some other aspects that we'll get into in a bit, they're primarily made up of bindings. In this example, you can see the first binding grants the storage admin role to an individual user, Alice, as well as to a group called admins. There's a second binding in this policy that grants Bob the compute admin role. Roles, of course, are groups of granular permissions in GCP. The storage admin role would let you create buckets and retrieve or store objects in those buckets. The compute admin role would contain the permissions to do things like create VM instances. So you may have noticed that the policies only talk about who can do what. They didn't indicate the where. In effect, in what areas of your cloud infrastructure they can perform these actions. That's where policy attachment comes in. Your cloud infrastructure in GCP is organized in the resource hierarchy. All of it exists under the organization node, which typically represents the company you work for. Under this, you can create folders for further categorization, such as business units, regions, or environment types. Ultimately though, your cloud resources themselves, such as the storage buckets, VMs, or database instances, will end up being created and managed in projects. Now, IAM policies can be attached to any of these nodes. The higher they're placed in the hierarchy, the more they grant access to. This is because the effects of policies inherit down. Because projects usually end up being a logical grouping of resources that represent a particular workload, they're a frequent attachment point for IAM policies to keep the effect of those policies scoped to just that workload. However, for many resource types, it is possible to set the policy even lower. You could, for example, grant a user access just to a single VM in a project rather than all of them. So let's take a look at how you can set policies at different levels in GCP. The policies are retrieved or modified through APIs that are made available by the service related to where you want to set the policy. For example, setting policies and projects, folders, or the organization node is all done through the resource manager service. Or setting a policy on a particular pub subtopic would be done through the pub sub service. The method to modify IAM policies is called set IAM policy. Here, you can see it exposed on the resource manager endpoint for projects or the pub sub endpoint related to topics. But how can you find which resource types support IAM policy attachment and which APIs to call for each? One good place to start is the API reference documentation. Start by looking up the reference for the service related to where you want to set a policy. Next, find the resource type upon which you wish to set that policy. And lastly, look for the set IAM policy method. Note too, where this exists, there will also be a get IAM policy method, which is what you can use to retrieve any existing policy attached to that resource. All of this documentation is available on cloud.google.com docs. But what if you want to get a bit fancier? Google provides an API discovery service, which itself is an API you can use to pull information about APIs that Google makes available, including the methods they provide. Let's take a look at the list APIs call. As you probably expected from its name, it returns a list of Google APIs you can use. In the example here, we're looking at the compute API entry that was returned from this call. This of course refers to the Google Cloud Compute Engine API. In its listing, it also includes the discovery REST URL for the service. Let's query that. In reviewing the discovery document for a specific API, you can see all resource types it exposes and the methods supported on each of those resource types. So for example, we can see here that there's a set IAM policy method available for OS images, meaning that you can set different IAM policies on different OS images if you wish. 
For you to set the right policies, it's helpful to understand how Google evaluates them when making access decisions. Referring back to our resource hierarchy, let's say Alice wants to delete a particular bucket called bucket A inside of this project. This is the IAM policy set on that project. In it, we can see a binding that grants Alice the storage admin role. So to IAM, what are our inputs here? To evaluate, we effectively need to determine if a certain principle, Alice, has the storage bucket's delete permission to be used against bucket A. To do so, we need to grab any potentially relevant IAM policies in the hierarchy. This includes grabbing the policy on the bucket itself, the project it's in, the folder that project is under, and the policy on the organization node itself. So we have our query, and we have all the relevant policies here. Evaluation ultimately happens binding by binding. The default state is not to grant access unless a policy explicitly says to. Starting at the bucket, we can see its policy contains no bindings, so this policy does not grant access. In moving up to the project, however, we see our binding from before that grants Alice the storage admin role. Because Alice is indicated in the policy and the storage admin role contains the storage bucket's delete permission, this binding would grant access. In continuing, however, we encounter another binding. Alice is not listed in this binding, nor does the compute admin role contain the needed permission. At the folder level, we see that group foo is granted the owner role, but because Alice is not in that group, this binding also does not grant her access. This is similar when looking at the policy on the organization node. Alice is neither a member of the admins group, nor is she a member of the security group. All that said, the evaluation decision here is to allow her to delete the bucket. This is because all IAM bindings are additive. If any grant access, the action will be allowed. Especially when you have a large amount of infrastructure deployed to Google Cloud, it can sometimes be difficult to determine whether a user does or does not have access to perform a given action on a specific resource. To help you better understand and visualize the evaluation logic we just went through, Google provides a tool in the Cloud Console web UI called the Policy Troubleshooter. In it, you can enter exactly the same three pieces of input we just talked about, the principle, the permission, and the resource. Policy Troubleshooter will then show you the effective access decision, as well as all the bindings and their effects in each relevant IAM policy. This can help you make adjustments to policies if the resulting access decision is not what you intended. To recap, where you attach policies matters. You can simplify policy management by setting them further up in the hierarchy to grant more access, but also lower down on the project or on individual resources when access needs to be more fine-grained. All bindings are additive, so it's important to understand the bindings you've configured to ensure you're not granting access to someone you did not intend. Understanding the permissions in the roles you're granting and who are members of the groups to whom you've granted access, as well as, of course, who controls the membership in those groups, are both important aspects of making informed policy management decisions. And finally, you can use tools that Google provides to better understand the effective state of your policies. One more thing before we move on, just because sometimes this trips people up. For some types of permissions, they're checked relative to the parent node compared to where you might think that they would be. Let's take the example of Alice trying to create a bucket. Here we see she's exercising the storage bucket's create permission. But the resource upon which this check is being performed is the project in which she's trying to create the bucket. These parent checks occur on permissions related to creating new resources, as well as listing resources within a certain node. So particularly for list permissions, make sure you're granted these on the parent container if you wish for a user to be able to enumerate all resources of a certain type within that container. Moving on. IAM has added some new features since it first launched. Recently, one such feature required us to version the schema of the policy content itself. Let's take a look at a basic policy example. In February of this year, though, we introduced a feature called IAM conditions, which allows you to configure when bindings should apply or not. Here, you can see a condition was added to the binding that states its effect is only valid for requests made before January 1st of 2021. 
but you might have also noticed the presence of this condition bumped the version field in the policy from one to three. When IAM originally launched, there were two assumptions baked into the policy schema. One was that each binding included one role and a list of members. And in any given policy, there would only be one binding for a given role. Conditions fundamentally changed this assumption. Now you could have two bindings for the same role granted to different people under different conditions. This has an effect on how you retrieve policies as well as how you modify them. When retrieving a policy using get IAM policy, you can specify which schema version you're requesting. If you request version three, it will return the policy with the conditions objects included. If, however, you specify version one or do not specify a version, you will not receive all the details of the conditions. Similarly, for set IAM policy, if you're submitting a policy that includes conditions objects, you must set its version field to three. Taking a look here, if you ran get IAM policy with the requested policy version set to three, you'll see the same return we saw earlier with the condition object intact. However, if schema version one is requested for a policy that contains conditions, you'll only see an indicator that there is a condition on a binding via a hash concatenated with the granted role name. In reality, though, this is pretty simple. Uh, for existing and future programmatic integrations that need to read or write IAM policies, just ensure they understand the syntax and, and semantics associated with the version three schema. Namely, this means your code should understand that there can be multiple instances of the same role across bindings in a given policy, and that some of those bindings may include a condition. So as long as this is the case, you can always request version three on get IAM policy and set version three on set IAM policy. Finally today, let's talk about best practices when it comes to safely modifying IAM policies. Critically here is understanding the get modify set flow. To modify any IAM policy, you must first retrieve the current state of the policy. This is done by executing a get IAM policy call against the resource to which the policy is attached. Once retrieved, your code can modify the policy in any way necessary. For example, you may wish to add an additional binding to the policy, in this case, giving Bob the compute admin role. Once you or your code have made the desired changes, the entire policy is submitted back using the set IAM policy call. In this example, th that includes any bindings that were already there, along with the additional binding that you've added. A common mistake many people make early on in using IAM is only submitting their changes in set IAM policy rather than the entire desired state of the policy inclusive of their changes. And any local modification performed by you or your code should follow the rules associated with the policy schema version being requested for set. Another best practice is ensuring appropriate concurrency control is in place for your policy modifications. Let's take a look at an example where Alice and Bob are both trying to modify a policy at roughly the same time. First, Alice executes get IAM policy as the start of her get modify set sequence. She or her code then begin making any desired modifications to the policy locally. Bob then kicks off his get modify set flow by requesting the policy currently set and begins his local modifications. He or his code then complete their changes and successfully set the updated policy. Shortly after, however, Alice's local modifications are complete and her updated policy is set. This, of course, has a very unexpected outcome. Because the basis on which Alice's local modifications were performed was the result of a get IAM policy issued before Bob's set IAM policy, Bob's changes were effectively overwritten by Alice's set IAM policy. To prevent situations like this, where two people may accidentally step on each other's as changes, IAM supports e-tags to provide concurrency control. When retrieving an IAM policy, it will include an e-tag field that represents the state of the policy as it exists at that time. During your modification, be sure to preserve this e-tag field exactly as it was returned from get IAM policy. Then, ensure the same e-tag is included in the payload during your set IAM policy. If the policy on that resource has changed since you last retrieved it, your set IAM policy call will appropriately fail. So to recap, again, always preserve the e-tag field all the way through the get modify set flow. If the policy on a resource has changed, your set IAM policy call will fail with an HTTP 409 conflict response. 
And in this case, your client can simply retry the entire get modify set operation so as to incorporate whatever the latest state of the policy is into its changes. While not directly related to the access management focus of this breakout, IAM policies do contain a field related to the audit logging configuration called audit configs. When performing changes intended to grant or revoke access, just be sure not to drop or otherwise modify this field as you may inadvertently change your audit logging configuration. Great. So let's pull what we just went through in this breakout together into a single example. Here, we have a Python script intended to add Alice to a project's IAM policy, granting her the compute admin role. Note that we first begin by retrieving the policy as it currently exists on the project, and doing so with a requested policy version of 3, because our code complies with all the rules defined in the version 3 schema. We store that uh, retrieved policy locally. Now, moving on to the second part of the Python script, we can begin our local modifications. You'll know that we focus our change specifically to the binding section of the retrieved policy, simply appending Alice and her new role grant to the retrieved policy. Keeping the changes focused here safely preserves the e-tag and the audit configs fields as originally retrieved. Next, because we know our code complies with the semantics of the policy three schema version, we can go ahead and set the policy version to three. While there weren't any conditions included on the new binding in this specific example, your code will probably need to accept changes of many different types. Some of those may include conditions. As a result, any IAM clients you write can always express version three in their set IAM policy calls, so long as the version three semantics are always safely followed. Finally, we submit the updated policy to Google Cloud using the set IAM policy call. Last recap of the breakout, uh, make sure to preserve the e-tag throughout the policy modification process. Only touch the fields you need when modifying and make sure any programmatic integrations you develop follow the assumptions baked into the version three policy schema. And that's all I have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for watching. And if you can't wait to get even more IAM info, we have a couple other great sessions dropping this week. I encourage you to check out covering IAM recommender and policy intelligence, both of which can be invaluable in helping you achieve least privilege in your environments. Thanks again and have a great day.